Well, uh, hello, everybody, and we are continuing. This is program 012A, and I've gone back to the beginning of the book. Um, yes, I've gone back to the beginning of the book. And yesterday was the 11th, actually. And today is the 12th. So our work now is with the work of the seed groups, and we're on page 46 of the externalization of the uh, hierarchy. So let's uh, get a little bracket here, and I'll be ready to go. So from January 1938. We have been endeavoring to apprehend a little more intelligently the work of the new age seed groups. Specifically, we've gone over the first three, their interrelation and their work as part of the new age setup, if I may um, employ such a term. We considered with some care the three major groups, and we saw that each of them has three tasks to perform, and we attempted a slight analysis of their planned uh, undertaking, undertakings. Now we can do the same with the remaining groups, particularly with the fourth and fifth, which have education and political work as their projects. Actually, you see, Interestingly, here it is 1938, but by 1939, he decided that he would not uh, continue um, with the formation of the other groups as the danger of the world war was already upon humanity. So um, he says, and then we will only briefly and indicate the triple intended purpose of the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth groups. I think we should get these triple purposes uh, isolated and made into one little document. We will not take time to consider the 10th, which will be composed of the key people in the other groups, the originating triangle in the other uh, groups. Beyond stating that when it's 27 members, three from each group are chosen and put on rapport with each other, there should come to all the groups such a quickening of their life that they will become one living, vibrant organism. Well, that uh, never did occur, but it will occur. The, the seed group project is a long one. And from what I understand, will uh, be concluded in its present phase, at least, by the year uh, 2200. So even now we have 180 years remaining for its development. We have to think um, in the long term, I would say. So three tasks to perform, each of them. It's a little hard to just remember exactly what they were. We'd have to pull them out and I think I can do that at some point. The fourth group. And this is a group I think uh, with which a lot of our work um, is associated. It's basically educational work. The educators of the new age. The fourth group has ahead of it a rich and most interesting course of study and an illuminating objective. Its instructions, see education in the new age, will evoke more interested response from a larger group of readers than perchance will 
the will be the case in the instructions of any of the other groups except those of the sixth whose subject is religion in the new age and the third esoteric healing well that makes sense those are the popular those are the popular subjects and i think our you know detailed study of theosophy uh, connects us with the fourth group and also interestingly with the eighth group of psychologists that work in a manner different from what we might uh, expect so rich and varied so he's giving them in order of their um, importance so let's see i've given them in order of their importance and they will be more definitely popular and meet a more general need so it seems like we have here education Uh, religion, healing, uh, these three. Is this correct? Yes. Education, the religious group, certainly this is um, very important at this time of dogmatic assertion by a number of the militant, almost militaristic religions. The interest which the teaching on education will evoke will be owing to the fact that education is today widely recognized as the major molding factor next to economic pressure and circumstance and there is a widespread interest in progressive education and in the new ideals which should and will eventually govern educators. So we have education in the new age. It seems that you know a number of these books were written to cover the C group uh, areas. No one particularly on science, Destiny of the Nations on Politics, yes. The Reappearance of the Christ on the New World Religion. Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1 and 2, related to the psychologist. No one particular, but chapters here and there on economics. And then the third is a synthetic and um, summary summary group so um he has stuck to the seed group model really and his works um really arising out of cosmic fire um reflect this when it comes to uh, magic, the last group is, in a sense, a magical, vitalizing, vivifying, synthetic group. And a treatise on white magic will be very useful in addition to the cosmic fire section uh, on uh, the rules of magic. Much more abbreviated, but uh, certainly essentialized. There is, he says, a definite stirring among the masses and the life of the mind, note that phrase, is now more active and potent than ever before. For this, there is an occult reason of a most interesting nature. Well, here we are 80 years ago, 70 something years ago, and uh, He's speaking of that which is still proceeding. I mean, we are in the midst of confronting some degenerative forces, which are a kind of recrudescence before their elimination. The last uh, flash in the pan, as it were, but 
there is definitely among the masses uh, and with the so-called man in the street, um, an awakening. And I think we've seen that uh, dramatically to be the case. Yeah, I'm gonna get myself a little more centered here. So those of you who have studied the secret doctrine <coughs> will remember that in that momentous period wherein animal man made the great transition into the human family and humanity came into being, developing the germ of individuality, you know, Leo was very strong then, as was Sagittarius and Gemini, the seed of self-consciousness and embryo intellect, we are told this event was brought about in three ways. And, uh, you know, the DK's ongoing lists to help us more clearly assimilate um, his teaching require uh, organization and repetition if they are going to make their way into our mind, consciousness. So the event was brought about in three ways. I guess we're probably, well, let's see, perhaps talking about what's going on uh, within our earth chain and upon our earth globe. There were other places where individualization did occur as on the moon chain and even in the previous major solar system. Number one, the seed of mind was implanted in some of the inspire, uh, aspiring animal men by the hierarchy. And these animal men became human beings of a very low order to be sure, but still men. They were sparked, if I might so express it, and a point of light appeared where before there was none, that point indicating a penetration of higher energies into lower energies and a, a presence of that which could grow into uh, individuality, into self-consciousness. Before, there was only a diffused atomic light, but no central point of light within the head and no indication of the higher centers. There were maybe higher centers, but um, they were uh, discs, placeholders, as it were. Uh, they were not activated in any way. And notice how the discussion of the light in the head enters here. The light in the head is a much more conscious possibility now, but it does begin with diffusion and a lack of focus and eventually becomes a central uh, concentrated point. Uh, these individuals along with the more advanced humanity which came to the planet in Atlantean times, having individualized elsewhere, i.e. the moon chain or the, well, I think mostly the moon chain humanity entered there in the third sub race, of the fourth root race, um, these constitute the most constitute the most advanced humanity of our present period. They represent culture and understanding, no matter where it is found, in what class or race. So the implantation of the spark of mind occurred and it says hierarchy was involved um, in this. Uh, I would say certainly the creative hierarchy of the solar angels, but uh, probably the lords of the flame played their role as well. So um, these individuals, the sparked ones, being individualized on our globe, along with the more advanced humanity which came to the planet in Atlantean times and 
if they came from the previous solar system, they came even before the sparking occurred and they were advanced indeed, relatively, uh, constitute the most advanced humanity of our present period. And they represent the culture, you know, the mental understanding, no matter where it may be found or in what class or race, because uh, he's being careful not to equate the outer form with the development of the inner psyche. Any race could be the home to uh, these groups. Okay, they are the advanced ones. And uh, as Blavatsky has told us, um, something like uh, hothouse plants artificially cultivated. Um, you know, in the, in the greenhouse <laughs> and under special uh, care and special environmental circumstances. Um, so here's the sparking of these uh, animal men. Yes, of a very low order, he says, yes, low order, but still the more advanced um, or developing into the more advanced types that we have at this time. Okay. So this was brought about <clears throat> the germ of individuality, the seed of self-consciousness, the embryo intellect, um, the transition um, brought about in three ways. And we've looked at the first, and we might call uh, implantation the first method. Not all animal men have had that implantation, but they were the more advanced of the period, some of the aspiring animal men, and they were sufficiently advanced to benefit from such an implantation. Next, the instinctual nature of animal man found active among those who had not reached the stage of any conscious aspiration was suddenly stimulated or vitalized by the coming into expression of the first group and the directed attention of the hierarchy working under the ancient law that energy follows thought. So this looks like so far that it's not the method of implantation, but the uh, fanning of the uh, flame. Now the, the mental unit uh, one learns is not suddenly created at the time of individualization. It has been uh, growing all along. That came as a surprise to me when I was uh, reading it because uh, well, we notice the mentality as it exists in some of the higher animals. And this probably indicates that the mental unit uh, has been developing. Okay. Thus gradually, with a remarkable rapidity, instinct became blend, blended into or resolved into its higher expression, the intellect. And, you know, we, we want to think about Alice Bailey and her book from intellect to intuition, uh, also mentioning the role of instinct in, in a triple sequence, instinct, intellect, intuition. Okay, the instinctual nature of animal man was suddenly stimulated. And uh, later in the day, I suppose, there are individualized um, 
human beings who trace their individualization from Lemurian times, but also those who were individualized quite a bit later in early Atlantean times. So there are a number of these different groups coming into the um, uh, human type of living gradually, however. Really, it took uh, three million years before the arrows shot from the bow in that uh, pictorial language. The um, implantation via the uh, arrow emanating from the solar angel before those arrows and the implantation resulted in anything that we would call real self-consciousness. So instinctual nature was stimulated. Thus in due course of time, a large group of animal men became human beings. They today represent civilization and the masses of ordinary intelligent people educated under the mass systems of the present time, able occasionally to think and to rise to mental emergencies uh, yet not highly cultured, they constitute the so-called general public, which we designate by the words upper and lower middle classes, or middle class people. The professional classes and the bourgeoisie everywhere. Okay. Well, maybe there was some kind of, uh, this looks like the fanning of the flame though, frankly. And um, this other group is the group that got sparked. And I want to emphasize that word sparked because it seems to be differentiated from this slower method well, and yet overall rapid considering, but the, um, the method used in connection with the animal men that were not so developed. So the first group, they're among the more advanced humanity, which came into the planet in Atlantean times, uh, both of them the advanced humanity that was sparked and the moonshine humanity, they constitute the most advanced humanity of the present period, I think, and somehow that should really be emphasized. And then the next group, the instinctual nature of animal man was stimulated. They had not reached any stage of conscious aspiration. Sometimes when you look at the uh, more advanced domestic, domestic animals, you, you even find something that looks like aspiration in them. Uh, I sometimes I see, you know, we have a little, a few little chihuahuas here. <laughs> and one of them is very good at walking on two legs. And, uh, can balance there for a long time. And you, you feel in that uprightness, a certain kind of uh, aspiration to be more like a, a biped, a human, a human being. There are also, strangely, some human beings, we don't know how it came to be, whether it's genetic or having to do with uh, some particular group, but they, when they locomote, they walk on all fours. They may be kind of sitting, uh, maybe even standing, but when they move, they come down to walking with their hands and feet, the way we normally see uh, like a dog walk. It's not a very pleasant sight and there's some anomaly going on there with their evolution. Anyway, the sudden, sudden stimulation and vitalization by the coming in of the first group um, and hierarchy uh, are all responsible for this uh, development of the second group and 
they are not yet in the range of initiation. They were not apparently sparked. Okay. Thus, in due course of time, a large group of animal men became human beings. And today they represent civilization and the mass of ordinary intelligent people. They are intelligent. Um, you know, probably not so much found among the, the real aspirants and disciples of the period, as we hope ourselves to be, at least after having generally a long uh, educational period and uh, individualization at a much earlier time and maybe in other places. They're educated under the mass <clears throat> systems of the present time, and they're able occasionally to think and to rise to mental emergencies, yet not highly cultured. You can, you know, maybe even sometimes tell the difference um, in the music that uh, people prefer uh, to listen to. There's quite a difference between a lot of uh, popular music and the more so-called highbrow music, you know, the long hair music. <laughs> um, this is the general public and you know, there are divisions even right now uh, between people who are living pretty much in the personality and those who are stretching their identification into the point of tension associated with soul living. And um, professional classes are here and the bourgeoisie. So it's, it's not a negligible group. Um, are they the sons of, um, they call sons of desire or something like that, um, found in a treatise on cosmic fire. And uh, there's a special, section given there as he's identifying the different types of lotuses which are in process of development. At the same time, now going on to point three, this is, you know, this is really an important section and uh, I guess maybe it's not found elsewhere, but uh, maybe it's derivative from a treatise on cosmic fire. At the same time, there is to be found a vast number of people who are human beings, but who are not the result of either of these two processes. They are the product of the slow moving influences of life itself, of what we are apt to call the evolutionary urge innate in matter they have painfully and with infinitely slow processes evolved out of the animal condition into that of the human being with an awakening conscience, an urge to betterment and an embryo mind of such a nature that it can respond to simple educational processes when available and is so responding. They are the illiterate masses, the still savage races. I suppose that kind of language wouldn't go over so well uh, today. Uh, and the low grade human beings who are met with in their millions on our planet. Okay, so he is descending, you know, he's starting from the advanced human being then going through the average member of today's civilization and then he goes point three to the to the lower group So um, he's giving us three classifications of human beings. And um, this is uh, interesting. Usually in my thought, I've 
looked at number one and three, and I've uh, assumed that those in number two do have the association of the solar angel, whereas those in number three uh, do not. The hierarchy has been involved with them and they had been stimulated and vitalized. Um, it's, I have divided humanity into two groups, one with the presence of the solar angel as the angel of the presence, and the other that does not yet have any implantation and which has moved slowly according to the natural laws of evolution. They will not be involved in the forcing process that is initiation. And really the second group will not be involved in that process either. The first group that has been sparked and also those that came in from elsewhere, they are definitely uh, candidates for the initiation process, candidates to be disciples uh, of the modern day. And we're told that every true disciple is preparing for initiation. So this still, I think, certainly in my mind, it needs to be studied and differentiated a bit. My question is, does group number two have the influence of the solar angels? That is the question. The cause for the momentous situation which calls for a realignment of our educational systems and processes and for a readjustment of our present concepts of education is to be found in the fact that the light of knowledge and the benefits which accrue from it have penetrated to the lowest grades of these slowly evolving people. Okay. So now a very rapid form of evolution relatively is possible for them even though they have been evolving in the long and slow, very gradual mass way. All three groups are now strictly human and not simply the first two because knowledge has penetrated um, into the awareness of the third group. So I find this enlightening, you know, basically make sure you read everything that Master DK writes because uh, there will be corrections and adjustment of ideas along the way. I'm finding some of my ideas being uh, adjusted right now. All three groups are now strictly human and not simply the first two. The highest of them is therefore nearing the stage of demonstrating that which is superhuman and the lowest is separating itself by almost imperceptible stages from the animal condition. So I suppose when you look at some of the more disadvantaged races or some that seem to be coming up slowly, uh, even though they have within them uh, souls of high caliber who are entering for purposes of service. You know, we have the uh, Aboriginal groups and uh, the Bushmen of Africa. Uh, we have the uh, Ainus of Japan. There may be others, but um, basically, they did not receive implantation, nor are they at this time, as far as I understand anyway, supervised by solar angels. Definitely, 
The first group is supervised by solar angels, either when coming into our fourth globe evolution, adjoining themselves or being adjoined to solar angels, or having um, some kind of, uh, well, you know, the, 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 the sparking, you might say, is a solar angelic penetration into their usual substance. Now, when it comes to the second group, um, kind of a fanning of the flame of intellect, to what extent are solar angels involved? Is it only for disciples at this time? Or is it something which average intelligent man has as a kind of higher power recognized as such? Uh, and even though it might not have begun that way, maybe somewhere along the way, the solar angels find in this second group candidates for association and for um, the sending in of energy which will hasten their development. As far as the third group goes, um, I think that has not yet occurred except when highly advanced souls are sent in to those less evolved groups in order to um, facilitate their upliftment. Now, these are difficult things to talk about because we live now entering the age of Aquarius, which is a great leveler. And uh, although hierarchy itself is ruled by uh, the uh, sign Aquarius, um, there is something in the Aquarian energy which is anti-hierarchical, in which does not want to accept that there are real fundamental differences in consciousness and even maybe in um, etheric uh, development between different kinds of human beings. It's looked at as elitism, you know, and uh, one group thinking they're better than another. Well, when we look to the masters, we realize we're all one being, but in terms of the uh, development in the uh, field of relatedness, we have different degrees of experience and unfoldment. And for some reason, um, this is not acceptable to so many who want to go with the uh, leveling uh, attitude. The, the so-called, you know, it's uh, symbolic, you know, kind of not exactly humorous, but at least uh, instructive, the tall poppy syndrome. You know, if one poppy has its head higher than another, you come along and whack it off. So everybody is totally equal. But we are all of us equal in essence in terms of our beingness, but we're not uh, equal in the time spent in our development and, and in the results of that time spent. And that's going to be one of the difficult teachings that is going to be associated with uh, occultism and one of the uh, reasons why many may reject it because they will look at it as elitism. So all three groups are now strictly human and not simply the first two. And many adjustments have to uh, be made because that is the truth, the cause for the momentous situation, which calls for different kinds of education and processes. Um, and th this was 70 years ago or more. So it's only increased now. What do they say that, um, 
a computer will be found within every six miles or something like that across the globe, wherever people live, no more than six miles away. I, I think I have the right figure and it may increase or decrease rather. Uh, a computer will be found and a, a great flood of potential advancement will enter. And as DK said, and do you realize that these um, uh, people who uh, have been individualizing later, that they don't have the load of karma that many of the more advanced types have? And, and he says, do you realize what that can mean? So maybe a very, very rapid advancement may be possible, which is um, when compared with the kind of advancement that the more uh, experienced types have been through, will be rapid indeed. So these are the three different types of human beings as DK is seeing it here. And uh, yeah, now I'm remembering lotuses of passion and desire. That's what it's called. And um, I just want to, if I can, um, if I can get this properly, L-O-T-U-S-E-S -E -S of passion, lotuses of passion. Let's see. So um, I'm going to uh, change my screen here. And here we have it. Lotuses of passion and desire. These are so called because their fundamental nature is embodied love in some one or other form. Sounds like second ray monads, a lot of them. Yeah, it, it is. The bulk of the monads of love are among this large group and they are to be seen incarnating in the bulk of the well-to-do kindly people of the world and they are divided into five groups of whom three individualized upon this planet and two were the very latest the last to individualize upon the moon chain five groups of lotuses of passion and desire and they pretty well correlate with what DK has been saying about group number two in the threefold division we have been studying. They have two petals unfolded and a third is for them at this time, the object of their attention. It's a mental petal. Uh, you know, I, I, I consider it ruled by Gemini from one perspective and Virgo from another, both of them mental and mercurial signs. Many may succeed in unfolding it before the seventh root race of this round. Mm. So that's uh, still involving our um, fourth chain in which the round is occurring. Uh, but the bulk of them will unfold it in the second root race of the next or fifth round and will stand ready before the close of the round to the fifth round to pass upon the probationary path, having unfolded one tier of petals and organized the second. You can understand uh, how technical this is and how important it is. Uh, Here we go. In trying to understand the timing here, this is a long time. Rounds uh, take uh, 300 uh, million years, something like that. And then there's also the twilight uh, or, or at least the interim period. It, it's a long time. So, you know, so many of the people who are lotuses of passion and desire uh, just are not uh, to the point where there is um, 
a mental, more mental focus, even though it's in the hall of ignorance. Well, look, I've tried to cover this um, in my ebook uh, on the egoic lotus. So um, all these uh, lotuses of the first circle are divided into groups, but interplay goes on between them. Energy in any center produces reflex energy in another. And it must be remembered that in closing the door in Atlantean times to animal kingdom and the consequent temporary cessation of the forming of any more bud lotuses, the effect was dual. Um, in directions other than the human or animal. Um, so, okay, well, fascinating subject, and uh, but we don't want to uh, get off the track. Suffice it to say that even with moon chain humanity, the latest of the moon chain humanity, it will be a long time before they are ready to tread the probationary path. The seventh root race is not immediate. Uh, the sixth root race will last, uh, some reference tells us, about 10 million years. It uh, begins um, maybe in another 2,000 something years, maybe at the age of, age of Capricorn, it begins. And then you have uh, the 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 kind of uh, interval where uh, between rounds and then the seventh or rather between root races maybe yeah this is the present round it's the fourth round yeah the seventh root race of the fourth round that's not immediate some millions of years are involved here and then stretching into the next round there will be that interval and you have to go through at least one root race uh, in the next round before we're ready to see the lotuses of passion and desire, whichever ones among them, go on to the probationary path. It's a much more extended view of evolution for eager man <laughs> uh, than he may uh, take into consideration. And of course, it also points to a huge, uh, it, it points to uh, a huge kind of uh, experience that many of the advanced human beings of the present time have undergone. Things are not fast, although unfoldments of a more rapid kind are now possible. I always think that that page is uh, somehow really important, all the different kinds of lotuses, you know, and where they come from. The, the masters know these divisions, and they know where the monads come from. Um, Earth is not a planet, the Earth scheme, which lasts throughout the solar system. Did it come in later? Would it disappear earlier? All of that has to be established, but uh, probably all of us have a more fundamental root in connection with one of the sacred planets. And these lotuses of passion and desire, I think, you know, have quite a bit to do with uh, Venus um, and uh, the second ray nature of Venus and Jupiter as well even though the humanity on the planet Venus, for instance, is very highly advanced compared to ours. Not too much is said about the uh, humanity uh, on Jupiter, but it has a very powerful second ray. So the question is, what does produce a second ray monad? You know, what planets may be involved and uh, where do the majority of them come from? I would say that when we're dealing with the advanced 
uh, aspirants and disciples of the period, a lot of them are third ray monads. At least the third ray is one of the monadic rays. And along with that may be included the subsidiaries of the third, four, five, six, and seven. All right, a little digression perhaps, uh, but uh, you know, relevant to what we have been studying. So mm, all three groups are now strictly human. And so that really represents an advancement in the uh, development of humanity. The highest of them is therefore nearing the stage of demonstrating that which is superhuman. And, and that is uh, entering the fifth kingdom of nature and eventually becoming a master. It's the acme of uh, humanity and we do consider it in a way superhuman. Uh, we consider, in a sense, the highest of the planes of Brahma, Atma, and Buddhi to be planes of superhumanity, even though a master is still a human being, whereas a Chohan maybe is, is not considered a, a human being. They are no longer men, as are the masters, uh, it is said, of Chohans. And the lowest group is separating itself by almost imperceptible stages. That's how slow, slowly things seem to go from the animal condition. And, and we see the brotherhood of the lower groups of human beings with the animal kingdom. They seem to understand them much more. I was, uh, you know, it just makes me shake when I think of it, but I was seeing today when uh, uh, this very aggressive man, uh, he's a dentist, he's, he's uh, trophy hunting. And he goes in there and he kills these magnificent animals and especially certain of the animals that have a real distinctness and they are loved by the local people it is just horrific and you know it must represent a, a great deficit in such an individual to seek to dominate and rob of life these most beautiful animals uh, he pays i don't know like $80,000 or pounds to go kill a great lion or maybe 35,000 pounds or dollars, I forget which, to kill a rare, the largest sheep that exists. <laughs> That's not the relationship that the lowest uh, of these groups has with the animal kingdom. They are the brotherhood between the human being and the animal is really appreciated by them, not by this uh, artificially raised individual filled with psychological problems who wants to destroy the possibilities of magnificent animals. Well, anyway, uh, you know, the the whole idea in the native people of the totems, the totem poles, uh, you have your own special animal as well, your animal spirit. There's a kind of a brotherhood there that is uh, beautiful to watch. Sometimes, you know, we have modern Western people who have this brotherhood. I was seeing a picture of Jane Goodall and her work with the gorillas and the chimpanzees, you know, and uh, uh, these animals having been individualized, even though trapped at the present moment in those types of forms due to what is called the sin of the mindless in the secret doctrine. 
She has such a beautiful relationship with these creatures and she draws out from them their best qualities. Now that's just the opposite of this uh, horrifically behaving dentist who uh, has been called the most hated man in the world. Well, you can see why. It's just something uh, extremely offensive about taking uh, taking life in form in that way. And obviously, the karma will be heavy, but eventually there is redemption. And such people who have sinned greatly, you know, the greater the sinner, the greater the saint. So one day, um, there will be redemption of that kind of uh, insufferable behavior. So the reason I'm talking about this is the fact that the third group has such a close relationship with the animal kingdom, considering the animals as brothers, which modern Aryan humanity does not so often do. So um, the, the, the separation from the animal kingdom uh, is slow and proceeds by imperceptible stages. Uh, this necessarily causes a cleavage, says the Tibetan, but it is one of which the highest group and the hierarchy itself is cognizant and which they heal by their own inclusiveness. In other words, there's quite a range between the values and desires and objectives of these three groups of human beings. That's why in political life you have to be, you know, so careful uh, when proposing an agenda suitable for the first group in a milieu which is uh, consisting of voters and uh, largely of the second group. Uh, we have to meet the needs where they are and what may be uh, definitely suitable for the first group as the fulfillment of their next step ahead is not at all suitable for the second group and especially not for the third. So to each group must be uh, presented opportunities in line with the uh, taking of their true next step. So these differences, they cause a cleavages, cleavage. But it is one in which the highest group and the hierarchy itself is cognizant and they heal by their own inclusiveness. So, you know, in a way, the greater includes the lesser. And even when we're dealing with planetary rulers, let's just say you're an Aquarius type and you're working with the esoteric ruler Jupiter, it doesn't mean that you're not including all you have passed through when the Orthodox ruler was Saturn or Uranus. Oh, gosh, I'm always ahead of myself. It must be that either I've read this and I'm having cryptonesia here or that it's just logical. Forget not that the greater can always include the lesser and thus bridge all gaps. See, let's just say that the masters can still relate to every phase of our humanity. Um, yes. And so when Master DK talks about the problems so many of them personality problems, which he said he wouldn't do, but he, out of compassion, I suppose he did. Uh, the problems of his students, he can identify because uh, with his, with what he has passed through in days gone by and thus with the Christ and thus with all masters. In this case, as stated here, the greater includes the lesser. It is the education of these three groups, says the Tibetan, 
which will be considered by the fourth group, which has as its project, Education in the New Age, the name of the book, right? Here again, we touch the threefold purpose which each group has to hold before itself and which in the present instance consists of. So yeah, we'll have to go back and um, capture these lists of three, and then maybe we can have a more synthetic view because they tend to be, you know, at least for me, sometimes lost in the uh, voluminous text that is being presented. But if they were all just in one document, every group three, every group three, every group three, so forth, we would be able to compare. So what are the three? Uh, three um, purposes, three threefold purpose of the fourth group. And they must educate all three groups which have been mentioned, um, advanced, uh, middling, uh, and uh, well, nascent, just emerging. into full humanhood. All right. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So number one. And now I guess maybe he is going to reverse direction. The uh, educating of the... I'm going to switch here again. The educating of the lowest of these groups into which humanity divides itself so that they can become strictly and consciously human rather than more uh, instinctual human beings, you know, uh, working in the hall of ignorance. At least they should enter the hall of learning. So this was the objective of the impulse which inspired the Renaissance and which lay back uh, behind the work of Rousseau, that great initiate. And this is the impulse which is today responsible for modern humanism with its apparent materialism and yet its deeply spiritual subjective program and purpose. This eventually produces civilization by an inflow of the light of knowledge. So the educating of the lowest of the groups that comes first and interesting, you know, that the Renaissance, which seemed to, if we're talking about the Western Renaissance, European Renaissance, which seemed to touch so many of the more cultured people, was also for the uh, sake um, of elevating the lowest of the groups. Maybe it, it took them out of the uh, era uh, or the uh, blind belief based on ignorance and authority in which they had been uh, laboring. But, uh, you know, this is the hierarchy's perspective here, that even the great Renaissance with its wonderful works of art and its uh, regeneration of religion and so forth was also for the sake of the lowest group, which had been simply rising en masse in a very slow evolutionary manner. All right, now, all of this is about education. And uh, just sometimes it just doesn't work. So this is um, 
the term education. The threefold purpose of this group of educators, which is the fourth of the seed groups. Um, then comes the education of the second group, um, which is going to be of a higher nature, obviously. So that it may be stimulated by the inflow of the light of wisdom, not just knowledge, and thus constitute a bridging group between the other two, being as it is, strictly human and self-conscious. Yes, this is the type of education that will be offered to the second group. Wisdom, the light of wisdom will enter and it, you know, kind of will take you to the entrance into the fifth kingdom of nature, uh, which entry is called um, entry into the hall of wisdom, out of the hall of learning. This process will make of its members cultural aspirants with a new sense of values and a recognition of spiritual objectives and with a developed ability to make them the molders of public opinion. So they will achieve their individuality and their ability to think uh, on their own and an increase of intelligence uh, and also an increase of wisdom. They will then be the most important group expressing the culture of the new age and they will set standards of values for the masses now these are venusian words you know uh, especially uh, culture and values So, um, and, and, and you find, you know, many people, I think, working in the arts today um, for whom this type of process is operative. And uh, they are refined and sensitive and learning to be wise about life and are setting the mental standard for civilization and uh, promoting the particular values which have to be uh, adopted in a particular civilization. And then we have another type of education, the education of the advanced thinkers of the aspirants and world disciples in applied knowledge, expressed wisdom, and occult understanding. I suppose each one of those words, applied, expressed, and um, to understand, each one of those words is of importance and distinct. So let's see. Um, well, you know, just for distinction, I'll just use that purplish color. Then we have the education of the advanced thinkers of the aspirants and world disciples in applied knowledge, expressed wisdom, and occult uh, understanding. This group synthesizes all that is available in the other two groups and thus forms the nucleus of the kingdom of God or the fifth kingdom, which is so rapidly coming into being. Well, I think with this type of education, this type of continuing education, uh, we find ourselves involved. We have, uh, pass through in our educational process um, 
the first two. And now we synthesize those results and uh, learn a higher uh, method or understanding of spiritual occultism, of true esotericism. So this group uh, synthesizes all that is available in the other two groups and thus forms the nucleus of the kingdom of God, of the fifth kingdom. And they are really, you know, uh, within the hall of wisdom. Okay, so they, they are operating in the hall of wisdom. Well, <laughs> okay. I'll, I know I have a code for it. Well, I think so many of us will find ourselves right here. And that's what we're doing in these studies. We're trying to apply our knowledge wisely and with occult understanding, which is a loving understanding of the true causes of things so that the effects can work out according to that which is intended within the divine plan. So in a way, this is a more scientific, technical group and uh, new languages are in, uh, involved here and evolved. It, it, it's a step beyond the work with uh, culture and uh, values. So uh, the members are not cultural aspirants. They are something different. They are aspirants to participation in the life of hierarchy. Uh, the, and, and the second group, of course, is on the way to doing this. And probably if we look at, you know, the recapitulatory progress that we have been through, we will recognize the periods of our lives when, or this particular incarnation, when we, let us say, move from group two to group one, or group, group three. He, he's reversed the order in this case. In the beginning, he did one, two, three, and now, he, in a way, he's doing uh, three, two, one, but still calling them one, two, three. I certainly, in my life, spent a lot of time, maybe as a cultural aspirant, and, uh, you know, uh, involved in the arts and presenting a more uh, refined type of music and uh, drama and all that kind of thing. And then found the taking up of the threads long ago established, which uh, would bring me into the field of occult thought. But it wasn't always so. But what I, can, I can trace the evolution and maybe, maybe you can too. If you find yourself in this field of the advanced thinkers and aspirants and world disciples and so forth, you probably underwent a recapitulation. And maybe you've been able to trace that and note the times when the shifts occurred. Um, I can note in my own life a shift from avid sports, it seems so remote, you know, uh, to um, the theatrical arts, the drama, and music, and then into occultism. I, I, and, and probably your horoscope will show something that promotes those shifts. Maybe you'll have a, an ingress of your sun into a new sign in that last 30 years. 
or maybe something smaller like the ingress of the moon into a new sign. And even there are ingresses of the ascendant, which have to be very important in terms of the soul. Um, I can pretty well identify in my own case with cancer rising when the ingress into Leo occurred with all of this uh, dramatic operatic work. And then came the ingress into Virgo, which was a much more conscious um, discipleship. So follow these ingresses, these changes of sign uh, in the Im important uh, areas of your chart. And uh, at least from the astrological perspective, uh, they will be significant. Maybe also from the Ray perspective. When he goes on and says, basically, I cannot do more than indicate these points for their proper theme and their elucidation will be dealt with in the group's instructions. Well, I suppose in, uh, in the various books uh, that have been compiled based upon group instructions, you know, instructions in telepathy and instructions in the dissipation of glamour, instructions in healing, instructions in education, and so forth. What I have stated, however, will serve to indicate to you the general theme of the new education and point the way to some of the considerations which are prompting my handling of this subject. You know, he's, he's really writing in a way for the education of those who will work along the line of the various seed groups. He's not covering all of them in the same detail. Being a second ray master, he wouldn't. And uh, maybe if he were a fifth ray master or specifically a third ray master, he might be more into science and economics. But um, the second ray is very important for him. Okay. The work to be done. Uh -huh. Now here comes the political, political uh, service. This is group number five. He only got so far as to appoint three of his students to this political effort. One of them was... Uh, a man who had certain letters written to him. He was his name, Bruala, something like that in South America, was it Argentina? He was a political worker and uh, you know, DK sympathized with him how difficult it was um, to develop th this esoteric approach where Roman Catholicism was so uh, deeply entrenched and where the, uh, the, the, the South American psyche uh, was so uh, Sagittarian in a sense, so aspirational, uh, so emotional in a sense. Uh, it will be, of course, emotional intuitive. It's going to be a great center of intuitive development uh, before before long and brazil will be a tremendous center of that kind of development along the 246 line anyway he was one and uh, there was another woman uh, that he very fiery person uh, sort of a one six combination uh, and he never got very far writing the her letters. Um, and uh, uh, there was yet another, I'm, I'm forgetting that one, but only three. And so he had to call that development to a halt because of uh, world problems. And I think he'll be 
resuming before long with the work that begins around 2025. So what's the work to be done by the fifth group, political service, the fifth group of disciples? He says it's by far the most difficult of any and in, in certain ways, many ways, it's far less advanced. Hmm. And why is that? So he will offer his uh, understanding of why. The reasons. The masses of men are as yet relatively so little evolved that the task of this group of workers must therefore necessarily be dependent upon the success of the educational work in the world as it will definitely be exemplified by the ideals and point of view of the fourth group and similar groups everywhere. So uh, just more light is needed before, uh, from the fourth group before the fifth group can uh, really be successful. Uh, I know some, you know, political science majors. It's never anything that interested me until I got into the Tibetans' work and I saw how absolutely necessary it was. So truly spiritual politics, I think, uh, lies a way off in its uh, development. And what's the other reason here that... Um, it is in many ways far less advanced. Let's see. Number two, so few truly first ray people are manifesting on the planet at this time. I mean, the first ray is there, but maybe we're talking about the first ray soul effect. And when they do, their work perforce proves destructive owing to the unevolved condition of the masses of men. And this is why revolutions so seldom, if ever, can be carried out without bloodshed. For the intended ideas have to be imposed. Now, elsewhere in the book, he talks about this group and he says, well, it's a noble thing to be an agent for the imposition of the will of God. Maybe it is, but the effect is as stated here so often, very few revolutions <clears throat> can be carried out without bloodshed. Look at the French Revolution, look at the American Revolution. Maybe there has been kind of a revolution in relation to the United Kingdom itself, which was uh, less bloody. I think, you know, in many ways they exported the bloodshed to their colonies. And this is uh, true with Belgium too and uh, other colonizing powers. So this is why revolutions so seldom, if ever, can be carried out without bloodshed. For the intended ideas have to be imposed upon the masses and are not immediately recognized and adapted by those masses. I wonder about Ataturk's revolution. I think there was a lot of violence um, connected. Uh, they evoke counter responses which arouse those in authority to wrong activity, as it were, putting down the rebellion. We just recently saw much of this going on in Egypt. The above ideas should arouse you to careful thought. Well, so very few first ray types, I, I would suppose, of a uh, of a spiritual nature and uh, you know where the exponent has transcended the egotism which so often accompanies the first ray 
but he does um, give uh, some of the blame for this, for this violent uh, type of process uh, over to the masses of men because they're not ready and they rebel. And then the first three types uh, come in in an unwise manner, which is violent. Putting down, uh, you know, so many people are killed in demonstrations. Um, we've had some of this in the United States recently, not uh, any kind of mass slaughter, but uh, in China, in Tiananmen Square, um, some years ago, there was a violent putting down of the democratically inclined uh, forces. But of course, were they the masses? They, they were maybe more advanced than the masses. And those in power maybe had the motive really to keep power. Uh, regardless of the merits of those who were rebelling. Now, here you can just tell that uh, DK is choosing his words wisely when he talks about us being aroused to, uh, to careful thought. So, the counter response is uh, one of the causes of violence, but the Rebellion of the unready masses is another cause. They cannot uh, take in the value of the uh, imposition of even the will of God when the first ray type is um, uh, more plan aligned. And there have been some of those who have been plan aligned. I'm thinking about the ending of slavery uh, in uh, Great Britain involving a, a, a powerful, righteous individual called William Wilberforce. I don't think that uh, aroused a great civil war, but when in the United States, uh, that same uh, abolitionist type of movement gained power, then there was a bloody rebellion and maybe the most costly war the United States has ever been in. And it's a war that continues underground with the personality rebelling against the imposition of plan-related ideas, freedom. That is the one of the um, lords of liberation whose nature is freedom was probably active at that time, and it was being carried out uh, by a great synthetic disciple avatar, Abraham Lincoln. Um, it, it'll be a while before the brotherhood and uh, equality and so forth. Uh, the other two air signs and their qualities uh, emerge into the uh, group focus as needing to be established. Freedom seems to be the first. And then would come the equality and then would come the brotherhood, at least in my opinion. Uh, let it not be forgotten that the objective of all true governmental control is right synthesis, not totalitarian synthesis, leading to right national and interior group activity. So the problem resolves itself into a dual one. First of all, We have the problem of the type of authority which should be recognized by the peoples. And secondly, we have the problem of the 
methods which should be employed so that the chosen authoritative measures will proceed either by the method of enforced control or would be of such a nature that they will evoke a generously rendered and recognized cooperation. Obviously, the second uh, alternative of the second uh, in the duality here is the desirable one. And between these two ways of working, many changes can be rung, though the system of cooperation willingly rendered by an intelligent majority has never yet been seen. It's an acquiescence uh, on the part of those who are to be governed with their own consent. Um, and it's a recognition of the hierarchical structure of the human race and of all kingdoms in nature. And that recognition is not with us yet. And that's where our educational work comes into uh, demand. So many cha changes can be rung, though the system of cooperation willingly rendered by an intelligent majority has never yet been seen. But we are moving up, we are moving towards such a condition of world consciousness and are on our way towards experimenting uh, with it. Yes, we can uh, do that. Then uh, a whole new method of governance will be put into place and maybe um, well we have opposite examples at the present time but i think uh, when these other more oppressive totalitarian methods have been proved to be wanting then we will have uh, what the tibetan is speaking of here. Uh, generously rendered uh, cooperation, generously rendered gratitude uh, for the leaders rather than slavish devotion uh, or rebellion against them. Right now, we oftentimes have these poles. So what type of authority, would it be monarchic? Would it be democratic? Would it be communistic, uh, you know, socialistic? What type of authority will uh, emerge and be acceptable? Uh, in the United States, uh, communism, as it is understood, which may be incorrect, um, is vociferously rejected. And there are other dictatorial uh, systems where democracy uh, is looked at askance and the leader does everything uh, he can to get around the uh, development of a true democracy. You know, you become, what should we say, president for life, you know? It's like having um, your hands on the levers of power uh, until you simply die and are no longer on the scene. And it doesn't give much free choice to the people who are governed. But anyway, uh, an experiment is underway and, the, and basically that's what the 
hierarchy does. It conducts experiments. And uh, the ones that work can be retained and otherwise not. So he says, uh, let me briefly indicate to you some of the modes of government which have been tried out or will be tried out in the near future. So we have to see what's appropriate to different kinds of people in different locales and so forth. Government, he's starting from the top here, government by um, a recognized spiritual hierarchy. This hierarchy will be related to the masses of the people by a chain of developed men and women who will act as the intermediaries between the ruling spiritual body and a people who are oriented to the world of right values. Well, this is, a, you know, a very high, whoopsie, um, right values. Let's see if I have it. Ah, uh -huh. that's not what I want. I think something happened in my uh, search for a bracket. So, um, yeah. Who are oriented towards right values. Okay. So let's see here. And um, we'll increase this. Sorry for the housekeeping. It's one of those things, you know, <clears throat> press the wrong button and there it is. Okay. So um, this is an ideal, right? Never yet achieved within our modern or even ancient humanity, maybe in the very early days of the God Kings, um, who maybe were incarnating solar angels, uh, something of this was being worked out, but then you didn't really have an intelligent humanity and they would not have been oriented towards what we consider at least to be right values. This is governance by the, uh, the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. <clears throat> it's um, something we really hope can, you know, take place. And make this a little bit smaller. Right. So um, we have the problem of the methods which should be employed. Okay, now a government by a recognized spiritual hierarchy. I think I've kind of lost my way here. And um, governance, okay. And let's see if I can do this properly. Okay, okay, I get it. Yep. So, uh, by a recognized spiritual hierarchy, there's only one. Right. Um, <clears throat> so this form of world control lies indefinitely ahead. And when it becomes possible, so to govern, the planetary hierarchy will have made its major approach and so forth. So uh, basically what I'm going to do 
is um, okay. Um, this form of world control lies indefinitely ahead. Okay. I, I seem to have, uh, I'm sorry for, I'm sorry for this, that there's a little bit of a delay here. And um, we have the problems of the methods which should be employed. Uh -huh. Right. So I see what's happened. I've, uh, yeah, I'm going to get rid of this. All right. Now we can resume a little bit. Sorry for that delay. Um, this form of world control lies indefinitely ahead. Um, and when it becomes possible so to govern, the planetary hierarchy will have made a major approach to Earth, and there will be thousands of men and women in touch with their organization because they will be developed enough to be sensitive to its thoughts and ideas. So we certainly have, uh, this is a, a matter, a matter. No, I see what the problem is. I see what the problem is. Mm. A matter for the future, indeed. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry for these delays and housekeeping issues here. <clears throat> but anyway, this form of government is far ahead, indefinitely ahead. And when it becomes possible so to govern, the planetary hierarchy will be uh, with us very much. <clears throat> it will have made its um, a major approach uh, to Earth. And remember, this does not happen all at once, not, not at all. Um, so there will be an intelligent humanity, spiritually inclined, and they will be in touch with the members of hierarchy, and they will be sensitive to its thoughts. Uh, indeed, a matter <clears throat> for the future. The, the second, let's see, some of the modes of government which have been tried out or will be tried out in the future. That's what we're looking at now. <clears throat> Number two, government by an oligarchy of illumined minds recognized as such by the massed thinkers and therefore chosen by them <clears throat> to rule. Okay. This too, you know. <laughs> seems far ahead of us, I think. <clears throat> and this ruling, this they will do through the education of the thinkers of the race in group ideas and in their right application. 
the system of education then prevalent <clears throat> will be utilized as the medium of reaching the masses and swinging them into line with the major ideas. And this will be done not by force, but through right understanding, uh, through uh, analysis, let's see here. <clears throat> discussion and experiment. And curiously enough, from the point of view of many, the spiritual hierarchy will then work largely through the world scientists who, being at that time convinced of the factual reality of the soul and wise in the use of the forces of the soul and of nature, will constitute a linking body of occultists. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. But one must keep going, you know, even though it uh, may not <clears throat> be with the best, best voice at the moment. Okay, so this is going to be a special group, a special group, uh, an oligarchy and uh, of illumined minds. And it will be recognized and force will not be applied and the masses will be swung into line by persuasion. And there will be, uh, to aid this, this bridging group of scientists that has proven the soul. Uh, this too seems far ahead in the future. The nature of the soul must be scientifically demonstrated, proved, proven. Scientifically, right. <clears throat> and then we have yet another method. Well, two more methods, looks like it. So here quite a bit is being written about the uh, fifth group, information that is not available elsewhere government by a true democracy. So this is not the oligarchy and this is not the spiritual hierarchy itself per se. Um, so this, this again will be possible through the right use of the systems of education and by a steady training of the people to recognize the finer values, the more correct point of view, the higher idealism and the spirit of synthesis and cooperative unity. Okay. This is, uh, all of these are high ideals and <clears throat> desirable when it comes to methods of governance. Cooperative unity differs from an enforced unity in that the subjective spirit and the objective form are functioning towards one recognized end. Today, such a thing as true democracy is unknown. I guess we can certainly concur with that. <clears throat> such a thing as true democracy is unknown. We have all kinds of uh, corruption and uh, influence by special forces. And the mass of uh, people, I suppose, let's see here. And the mass of the people in the democratic countries are as much at the mercy of the politicians and of the 
financial forces as are the people under the rule of dictatorships, enlightened or unenlightened. Okay. These latter might be regarded as selfish idealists. But I would have you here note the word idealist. When, however, the world has in it more truly awakened people and more thinking men and women, hence our educated responsibility, we shall see a purification of the political field taking place and a cleansing of our processes of representation instituted as well uh, instituted instituted excuse me <laughs> as well as a more exacting accounting required from the people of those whom they have chosen to put in authority it sounds uh, like responsibility it, it sounds even uh, to have financial implications there must eventually be a closer tie up between the educational system the legal system and the government but it will all be directed to an effort to work out the best ideals of the thinkers of the day this period does not lie so far ahead as you might imagine particularly if the first move in this direction is made by the new group of world servers. Well, the governance by the oligarchy and by the spiritual hierarchy, they are further ahead. I think this is a very interesting section. <clears throat> right. Um, the selfish idealists, we have to understand who these people are. Right now, we have various forms of rather uh, corrupt and crudely originated governance. It's not the best by any means, and it's nowhere near what he's speaking of here. So let us, um, a, true, a true democracy uh, is emerging, and maybe not so far ahead as we think. So he tells us, we don't want a totalitarian uh, in enforcement, we might say. Cooperative unity differs from an enforced unity in that the subjective spirit and the objective form are functioning <clears throat> towards one recognized end, and this is not, again, the case today. It's, it makes us look as if we're in a rather primitive condition. And this was written 70 something years ago, 72 years ago. And here we are still in the midst of corruption. Okay. So I'm going to uh, distinguish these. And finally, we'll look for the breakthrough of this method a purification of the process more truly awakened people <clears throat> the cleansing of our processes of representation sometimes there's a great divide between those who elected the representative and what the representative does <clears throat> when uh, placed in a powerful position. And people will be held accountable. And the interplay of education 
the legal system and the government will be uh, much more uh, tight than it is now, much more mutually helpful. I'm trying to think if I ever, if I remember, you know, having read this, um, maybe one has not read all the books with equal care. <clears throat> okay. Now, what are these first moves of the new group of world servers? Which first moves would help us develop this true democracy more rapidly than otherwise? <clears throat> Pretty soon Mercury will no longer be retrograde and I hope um, some of the difficulties that I'm facing today will not be part of the presentation. So this first move, what about it? It involves a right comprehension of goodwill that for mostly. These three systems, which are three major systems, correspond to the three major rays of synthesis of idealism and of intelligence. And isn't it interesting what he says, which are only other names for the rays of will or power, of love, wisdom, idealism, hmm? and of active intelligence. All right. So the term idealism is given to the second ray which links it closely, therefore, with the sixth ray of idealism and water power remains the same. <clears throat> okay. Oop. There we go. Okay, so goodwill is paramount. Goodwill is love and action. Goodwill will bring us all together. It, it seems innocuous. It seems kind of a, a harmless idea. Of course, harmlessness itself is a, a, a huge value that we must, uh, you know, at last, develop properly. Okay. They correspond to the three major rays of synthesis, idealism, and intelligence, which are only other names for the three rays. So the new group of world servers has a very big role in advancing the onset of a true democracy with truly representative government, uh, the end of corruption, uh, an attitude of non-coercion. Uh, these are the factors which can bring us at least into democracy. The oligarchy is another matter. Usually that term represents a financial oligarchy, but we're talking about an oligarchy of light and wisdom. <clears throat> and finally, in the first position, we're talking about a kind of governance by the spiritual hierarchy uh, itself. And then there is um, government by dictatorship and also three 
uh, distinct methods involved here. And the first is ruled by a monarchy. Now we have monarchy, democracy, and communism or socialism. And elsewhere, maybe, maybe here too, he discusses that monarchy reflects Shambhala, democracy reflects hierarchy, and communism or socialism is uh, man made. So, rule by a monarchy limited usually today by the will of the people. We have these constitutional monarchies, not as in old days, absolute monarchies, or rather by the politicians of the period, you know, ever since the Magna Carta, but symbolic of the ultimate rule of the hierarchy under the kingship of the Lord of the world. This is the symbolism of it. <clears throat> and um, I think Plato caught uh, the drift of this idea with his Republic and with his uh, philosopher King. So rule by monarchy is a reflecting hierarchy and even more so Shambhala. So government by dictatorship. The next point B, rule by the leader of some democratic country who is usually called a president or by some statesman, no matter by what name he may choose to be called, who is frequently an idealist, though limited by his faulty human nature, by the period in which he lives, by his advisors, and by the widespread corruption and selfishness. This we can see strongly in evidence now. Okay. <clears throat> A study of such men who have held office in this capacity made by a fair-minded neutral will usually demonstrate the fact that they held office under the influence of some idea which was in itself intrinsically right, no matter how applied, which was forward moving in its concept and belonged to the then new age. And this relates them to the second ray because of the ideal. Okay. Some idea or ideal, hence the second ray. Now, sometimes we do get strictly selfish dictators and they generally cannot last too long. We had, you know, uh, maybe Idi Amin in Africa was a good such example. There were others who modified their relationship with the will of the people accordingly. Um, Nelson Mandela was not such a dictator. A very intelligent initiate, I, I believe. A unifier working under um, the law of synthesis. Okay. But now we're just kind of examining different modes of dictatorship. And then point C, rule by dictators, straight dictators, I guess, whose animating principle is not one of the new age ideals emerging in their particular time, but an idealism of a more material kind, the generally recognized 
present idealism. Now, I wonder where we would put uh, Stalin in this, where we would put Mao uh, in this. So this is a lower form of dictatorship, but nevertheless, a form of dictatorship. It's not so animated by uh, a truer idealism connected with the second ray. <clears throat> they are not usually reactionary nor are they found among the intuitive workers of their age, but they take what is grounded, settled, and easily available, made so by the thinkers of their time, and then give it a material, national, and selfish twist and objective, and so force it on the masses by fear, warlike means, and material promises. Does this sound uh, familiar? I think if we go to some of the dictatorships here, we will find ideals which are materialistic, personal, national, selfish. There are a number such today, even today, the year 2020. Maybe not reactionary, however, but not intuitive, not deep, taking what is already established and more uh, akin to personality values. And then they enter into materialism, nationalism, selfishness, even a kind of uh, totalitarian oppression through fear and military means. And of course, giving the masses a material uh, incentive through material promises. So they belong therefore more practically to the third ray methods of work for they are intelligent, expedient and materially constructive. True idealism involving as it must the new age patterns and religious incentives are lacking in their techniques. So, you know, more connected with the third ray of activity and of intelligence, even though they will be uh, largely first-rate types in power. True idealism is different um, and has been uh, described above. I think we should be able to look across the world now and find the different kinds of uh, rulers under the categories here given. Nevertheless, they do lead the race on another step for they have a mass effect in evoking thought and sometimes eventual resistance as the result of that thought. In other words, they contribute to their own undermining because they have awakened uh, the masses to think, maybe not uh, a purposeful action, but that has been the response. And maybe that very kind of thing, you know, is going on these days um, amongst uh, the nationals of that country, which is heir to the Piscean sixth ray civilization the people who were so die hard and idealistically convinced without thought are being made to think and then they begin to see and then rebellion can occur. 
not necessarily a bloody rebellion, but uh, rebellion against the choices that they had made when they were in a more ignorant uh, and non-thoughtful state. So three types of um, dictatorship, a monarchy, a leader of a democratic country, i.e. a president or some sort of authoritative statesman, uh, but oftentimes checked and balanced by other branches of government. Um, and then straight dictators, the lowest form of all, bringing about perhaps a rebellion against their methods. All right. Later, we shall study these and other ways of governing and analyze their ordinary modern expressions and future spiritual correspondences. These will someday appear on earth as a result of the many experiments going on, today going on, and we are to remember this. Now, I don't know if he ever got to do this or whether he was in, uh, interrupted when he began uh, to try to move on in the political field. Interesting that the discontinuance um, of the organizing of the groups of nine, the C groups, occurred when the organizing of the political group was in progress. As I earlier said, the processes of education, of law and of government are so closely allied and so definitely related that if ever the work of this fifth group reaches the stage where it is indeed a germ of a new age organism, and many such groups will necessarily appear in the different countries of the world, it will be found that they will act as a clearinghouse or a linking body between the educators of the time, those whose task it is to enforce the law, and the statesmen who are chosen, the statesmen who are chosen by the educated masses to formulate the laws whereby they should be government governed. So we have, um, you know, some reflection here of uh, the legislature here, uh, legislature. And here we have the um, the executive branch, you know, consisting of the enforcers of law, executive branch, and we need a judiciary here to complete the triangle, but perhaps the, uh, maybe the judiciary, uh, is related to both uh, and certainly to the legislature. But it does determine what is legal and can thereby be enforced by the action oriented executive branch. So, three groups are linking together. The processes of education, of law, and of government are closely allied. Okay.
Yeah, and so, you know, basically, we see again ways of implicating the first three rays. Maybe law enforcement can uh, come in under the uh, first ray, but its formulation, intelligent formulation, does have first ray in it, but may, maybe the third ray. The education has in it the second ray. So a new um, organism is being formed. Uh, and in different countries, it, they will grow up examples of this type of organism. So we have here um, a, a, a grouping of educators and uh, law enforcers and statesmen, these three. Now, right now, that kind of relationship is still not anywhere near uh, satisfactory. Okay. In view of the steady progress, right. So, so I think what we have here now is the um, discussion of the next group, which is the religious group. So we have finished uh, what he has to say. Um, regarding the difficulties and the challenges and the very great importance of the fifth group, which will hold the um, seed to educating regarding the methods, the appropriate methods of governance. And now he's going to get into the new world religion. And I think this would be a good place for us to stop maybe the next time if we have a long program, um, we will be able to complete something up to page 61. It will be another, um, what should we say, another five, six pages. So let's um, go back to the origin of this. Now, obviously, this really, you know, really has to be studied because it's it's difficult to know which people are best governed by which system. Obviously, the spiritual hierarchical system is not for this time. The oligarchical system of light and wisdom is still far ahead. True democracy has not yet been achieved, and even our present uh, democracies and um, are, are, are really kinds of dictatorships, which is uh, interesting how he puts it. There are three roles here. Um, monarchy, um, presidents uh, of democracies and elected officials and leaders with great authority. And then we have actual uh, rather materialistic dictators. So they all come under the uh, third category of dictatorship. And, and these are, this last group, govern, government by dictatorship, is pretty well how people are governed today. 
they may think they have a president, but if the president is not watched, that president will be soon finding a way to manipulate himself into a the status of president for life. And what is the difference there between that and just a straight, uh, rather materialistic uh, dictatorship? So we're still, in a way, uh, at a quite a low level of um, governance, as it is expressed in the wor uh, world today. The, there is no true democracy yet. There are uh, low level monarchies, but they are evolving into constitutional monarchies where the monarchs must be distinguished by their service to the people. But there are also these um, corruptions which make it possible for leaders essentially to be dictators. And maybe monarchs essentially to be dictators, even though constitutional monarchies are growing up uh, everywhere. If you look at the United Kingdom, yes, there is uh, a tradition of royalty and monarchy, and in some of the European nations it is so, but they, the, the power of governance really lies in other organs uh, of government, parliaments and uh, Senates and houses of representatives, uh, they uh, are the real power of the nation. And the monarchy has slipped. It is more likely to find a dictatorship which does not declare itself to be a dictatorship among leaders and presidents who tend to want to usurp uh, power for themselves in a personal manner, believing perhaps they are the only ones who can guide their nation into, a, into satisfactory channels. We see this uh, in Russia at the present time. We see it hinted at in the United States. We see some other European nations that uh, seem to be moving in, in that direction. Until we solve the problem of egoism and group consciousness, and until we strike a major blow at selfishness, we're not going to have the kind of governance which is truly beneficial to all the people and which lifts the, the nation to the point where it can express uh, dominantly its soul nature and then thus become a, a true representative in its own way of the soul of uh, humanity. So there's a lot of work to be done in this particular field. Uh, what did he say? The first ray, sixth ray, and seventh ray are particularly involved in the political work, and I and I think we can see uh, their place, the place of those particular rays and these methods of governance. We seem to be retrogressing in some ways, uh, trying to reactivate a close link between church and state. Uh, the United States was founded on Masonic principles which demanded the separation between church and state, because taken together, you have a tremendous potential for oppressive totalitarianism. Are we going to slide back into that, or will the people through education awaken and, and throw off the totalitarianism defeating uh, that mode 
of governance. Basically, DK tells us uh, totalitarianism it is, which must be defeated because it, it robs uh, humanity of the richness of its uh, variety. Uh, it robs humanity of its will to express the different qualities uniquely resident in each person. So, let us then, uh, we have reached page 55, and we began somewhere back here. I should always know where we begin, you know? Then I won't have to go through this painful process of, of going backwards and finding, um, yeah, well, there it is. Page 46 to 55. So here we have um, these two keyboards, you know, they just sometimes 46 to 55 and we ended with 39 to 46, okay. So we only have a few pages and we're completed um, with this book. I mean, you can't really say completed, but you can say that some ideas have been expressed which um, are definitely useful in the case of the Tibetan and maybe a few things that I've said also have some utility. There are there are good days and there are bad days, and um, until Mercury goes direct again, uh, I might have a, a series of semi bad days. You know, getting caught in housekeeping work, so to speak, against my will. So number thirteen, and we'll take this up on the XX of July. Maybe it'll be today. I'd like to finish this. And um, we'll begin with page 55 and maybe make it to 61. And here we go from 46 to 55. This is the housekeeping I'm talking about. But if I shut everything down, you know, it tends to take a lot of time, so please bear with me. I appreciate that. There's a little bit of informality in what I'm doing, obviously. And uh, it's not a polished performance by any means, <laughs> but at least we get a chance to think together about the illumining thoughts that the Tibetan has presented and and more and more as I can I'd like to have uh, webinars where we actually have a chance to exchange on these matters meanwhile commentary on the books uh, is increasingly available now already for glamour we can do some exchanging and uh, Tuya and I in our ask program we have the reappearance of the Christ and uh, the destiny of the nations, but those are largely broadcasts. In the esoteric United Nations, we have a chance to exchange on the destiny uh, of the nations. There's just a lot, a lot to do in terms of assimilation for the next five years. We want to be ready for Master DK's third presentation, and I really don't see any other way except to assimilate, absorb, understand, and apply what we can uh, in order to prepare ourselves for the next installment of bridging treatises, which he has in mind to complete his planned threefold installment, which uh, began with the work of Madame Blavatsky and continued into the Alice Bailey work of some 30 years. 
Okay, friends. So we'll we'll come back to this then. And um, every page has such fascinating material. And you know, we we have to begin to think the way the hierarchy thinks. They really have the whole planet in mind. Now, you know, we can have the planet in mind. We have to really work locally, of course, and the scope of our effectiveness is very much limited compared to theirs, but at least to develop what Dane Rudyard called planetar planetarized consciousness in his book, since renamed, I guess, but the planetarization of consciousness. We really need that. Now, we can only go so far in the uh, solar systemization <laughs> of consciousness and take in the whole solar system. Well, we have some hints. Of course, it's beyond anything we can do uh, in a practical sense. We have to work right here in our little sphere, in our nation, in our community, in our families and individually uh, to do what we can uh, esoterically and in other ways to advance human progress. It's humble work, but it's not easy work. Sometimes people think that if it's humble, it's easy. It's not. It just involves a true sense of proportion, an adjusted sense of right proportion, which is uh, humility. So we serve as we can, as effectively as we can, with what knowledge we have, with that knowledge ever growing under the wise, illumined guidance of such teachers as the Master DK. We have the flow into our consciousness of great perspectives, and they have to be made to make sense to us. And that's our own labor, the making sense of what is said, not just somehow reading it, memorizing it, and that's that, but really working with it so that when it comes to our effectiveness and service, that effectiveness can really be uh, enhanced. Okay, then we have a bit more and now I'll close this down and uh, thanking you with lots of love and many blessings for attending this, no matter what year it may be in. If you got this far, you're attending. <laughs> and uh, the day will come soon when, when the new teaching will be brought forward and the new schools will arise and the new church, the universal church will appear and the Masonic organism will take its place as a great uh, empowering and educating uh, assembly uh, body of cooperators. So we'll see you soon. Bye-bye for now.